All right, everybody wave. Exciting. Here we are this Thursday, a couple of weeks before the launch of the most amazing year ever on books, right? So uh, we're going to kick this off with a beautiful empathy session with you. That's how we do work around here. So this is our opportunity to connect as transitional kindergarten through third grade. Let me just give you some information on where we're going to go with this. Uh, so one of the things that's really special about Design 39 Campus, and I'm going to share a screen real quick, is that we have these what we call our culture cards. And so the culture cards are things we do from everything from hiring like what we did today. Uh, we're interviewing because we're growing uh, in our kindergarten through third grade space. So we're excited about that. So we'll have a new hire coming on tomorrow. But it's empathizing to understand. So really where we can dig into this work and understanding what is it that need? How do we solve for that? And then ultimately, because what we want to do is research through this ambiguity. And that's the big piece. And we don't just create a schedule and say, here it is. It's like, what is the need of our family? What are some insights that we can engage with you all? And then ultimately, to prototype really some amazing, awesome things. So we call it, right, prototyping greatness. And that's ultimately what we want is this great experience around um, learning for our kids. So what we had with you all was... Um, uh, opportunity for you to showcase some of those things across this Padlet. And the best part is, you know, even though our teachers are scheduled to work the first three days before school starts, they've been working every single day. They've been looking at all this empathy work. And so we have an amazing learning experience designers here today from transitional kindergarten all the way through third grade. And they've been working, working, working. And this is our kind of our final phase so that we can really do some brilliant design work. So thank you for that applause, Casey. Um, with that being said, Transitional Kindergarten, let's hear from Michelle and say hello. Hi everyone, Michelle Jeanette, I'm TK this year. Looking forward to um, connecting with all of you. And some few reps from our kindergarten team. Thank you, Michelle. And first grade and second grade. Uh, Christina Adamson, one, two. Jamie Sacramento, one, two. Taylor Becker, one, two. Yeah. Samantha Jacobs, one, two. Uh, Julie Mori, one, two. Formerly Ms. Emily Escalona, now Emily Brooks. Erica Diamond, one, two. And our amazing third grade team members represented. Dana Clarkson, grade three. Cammy Diaz, third grade. They're, they're always so polite, right? They just want to make sure that everybody gets a space and a voice. So those are a few of our learning experience designers, our teachers. So they're here to listen and really empathize. So what we're going to be doing is I want to show one more screen and then I'll share this screen with you so that we're going to be digging in a little bit deeper to some insights and questions because there's some tensions here. And ultimately, we want to be able to create um, some awesome experiences because we're finding something that's really unique. If we can understand this a little bit deeper, we actually can co-design around that. So there's going to be a first question from this Padlet, and I'll put the link in the chat box so that you can have access to that. And so we're going to kick this off with a big round of applause. I heard some cheering in the background. I know I did. It was for Cami Dias. Big round of applause. Woo! Cami, you're up. All right. So um, I'm tasked with looking through the first column of our Padlets. And it really made me think of um, myself as an LED at Design 39 and also having two kids at Design 39. One is going into fourth and the other is going into sixth grade. And um, as a parent, it was hard to figure out um, what does partnership with the LEDs look like? And so, our question to you tonight to start off is to gain empathy, to gain insight, is truly understanding what does partnership between LEDs and your family look like? We know that we have parents, um, families who work um, and prefer to be on campus. And we also know there are families who prefer virtual learning and uh, for this upcoming school year. So again, gaining empathy and just understanding from your voice, what does partnership look like between LEDs and your family? So this is where we need your parent voice to kind of start telling us, what does partnership look like? This is co-designing, so no sitting down. If you've joined this call, you better be talking. And I'm looking at you, Bob. <laughs> so Cami, thank you. So what does partnership look like? That partnership between home and campus. 
Well, uh, this is Adrian. Uh, hi. I have a third grader, Bryce. Um, so fundamentally, I'm assuming that you're asking uh, the question specific to the beginning of the fall semester, which is going to be virtual. So I'm going to try to answer in the context of completely virtual for now. And I think based on the experience from spring, um, I think partnership would be twofold. One is a engagement with the LED, between the LED and the children on an ongoing basis, not just five, 10 minutes a day, and then the kids were doing a lot of work on their own. And then the second part of that is, I think parents need a lot of guidance on how to teach. We're not teachers, we're not trained as teachers. And those were some of the things that we, at least from my perspective, were lacking when we were trying to guide our children to um, participate and learn in the spring semester, which I know it was very different than the way this is going to be scheduled, but I'm just trying to correlate to something that I have a baseline on. Yeah, that was super helpful. So this idea of what's the parent ed, how do parents really support from home when parents are strong partners in the instructional space? Great. Someone can add to that or add a new thought around that. Hi, this is Jen. My um, my daughter was um, she. This will be her third year at Design Thirty Nine. So she was in TK with Miss Mori and last year with Miss Church, and I cannot tell you how impressed I was with how well the kindergarten class took to like pivoting to the online learning. I mean, obviously she'd like to be on campus. She misses her friends, but I've just been so impressed like I don't even know how to really put that into words <laughs> it was amazing so um I mean whatever we can do to just you know move on top of that but I've just and I've said it to other parents and I have um neighbors who have kids at other you know elementary schools that didn't experience the same things but I'm we're, just... gonna, we're gonna ask you to dig in a little bit what was a specific thing that happened that wow that made it really helpful um I think you know, given that they, you know, they were kindergartners and learning the technology, but um, learning how to use it appropriately. And the, I mean, the teachers are just so patient. And I loved the, um, I guess it was the game board um, that helped that direct them. They kept, they were self-directed. And I mean, for being five and six years old, they just took to it so well. Um, and I think they had the platform from Design 39 and learning the technology to begin with. But, um, you know, again, they she would love to be back on campus, but I just, I could not be more pleased with how well this has been handled. Brilliant, so something specifically, we heard from the LEDs, this, this way for students to engage uh, a platform where they can uh, interact. Awesome, mm -hmm. right. thanks. Someone else mm -hmm. add to that or something new? Hi, Joe. Yash, hello. Um, thanks. I, uh, I'd just like to add a quick word of appreciation to Ms. Becker. Um, she, I mean, I think for us, at least as a, as a parent, even though I'm on the collaborative, um, if it wasn't for Ms. Becker and the time that she spent with our child, even thereafter when we pivoted to a virtual training pro, uh, distance learning process, um, the fact that she had bonded with Ms. Becker during the first six months of the year was instrumental. I think in my kid, at least, being able to maintain her attention span during the Zoom classes. And she, Ms. Becker put it all out. We had four hours or three hours of Zoom classes every day and she kept everybody on top of it. So um, hats off. I mean, I really appreciate everything you did, Ms. Becker. Thank you so much. Now okay. said that, I, I think that because of the empathy that my child found in Ms. Becker, it helped her in the distance learning process. So if there's something we can do that would extend the one-on-one -on -one interaction between the LED and the child during the initial first couple of weeks when school starts so that the, the child can have a personal rapport with the LED, that might help thereafter to then have 
uh, larger classes together and breakout sessions in Zoom and so on. But lacking that physical interaction, I think, where Ms. Becker would come up and touch my child's head or look at her um, and inspire her. Lacking that, I think that we have to create that personal bond in the beginning, in the first couple of weeks, and it might help the kids uh, to be able to be productive in this learning in this learning process, even though they aren't physically together. Really helpful. So we're trying to get six minutes per question because we have questions that our LEDs are really interested in. And Yash, that reminds me to mention to you, we're super unique in this space. The teams uh, from the Welcome Center all the way back to the LEDs have been working on thoughtful placements of our students. So coming Friday, that means tomorrow night and into Saturday, you're gonna know your teacher's LED. So you're gonna have rosters put out to you tomorrow. That's super unique. And I can see some smiles there. And I want you to trust us with that. Um, we're really trying to build out those relationships early on before school even starts. So that's really critical. And that's not because it starts on September 2nd, it's because it starts now. And because of that, we're not wanting to pivot um, all of the, um, like, I want this teacher, I want this teacher. No, we need to have some stability. So right out the gate, this is your teachers. You're gonna build that relationship with them. So we're not gonna be uh, like hopscotching around and trying to get that right teacher. So, uh, because each one is right. So thank you for that. And um, I think we're going to keep adding to that because we want to get to the next question. So next question comes from, drum roll. And if you have something to add to that, uh, please put it into the Padlet wall, Christina and Emily. Um, our question stems out of the fact there was a lot of data about too much device time, too much time on device, um, too much Zoom time. And so our question is, what would purposeful off device time look like to you as families? because that is a lot of time without us. So what does that look like to you? So purposeful off time. So it's in now, there's a new column in the chat, or sorry, in the digging into this. So I'll show you that again. It's on this Padlet wall, digging into empathy. It's the second question there. As you know, um, keep adding to, you see something there, add to it, add to it. And uh, we're looking for some responses to that. We have good wait time, I'm just telling you. I'll chime in here. Um, I'm Samantha. And um, I think for off time, what was nice was I, um, for my son's first one, two class, they were able to split up into like child-led Zoom, Zooms. Um, so one was like young authors based, one was like builders based, and the kids came up with these like topics they were passionate about, and then they uh, would collaborate uh, weekly on that Zoom. So for the off times, my son would be working on his writings and working on his building. And then once they grouped together, they would share about him. So that was purposeful, I thought. And it was a nice way to make them feel like they had um, kind of, uh, they could take reins over their learning. Oh, and I just wanted to add one more thing. Uh, we loved the excursions led by the various LEDs and the amazing, really cool, engaging, uh, interactive topics. And I think that was another option for my son to feel like, wow, there's like six different classes I can choose from. I'm really interested in this one. And he got to choose. And so it was really based off of like something he was interested in learning more about. Someone new want to add to that or uh, a way to create that opportunity of purposeful off time? So maybe think about times when your kid was really engaged and it did involve you having to sit with them. What were your kids doing that was super engaging during the off time to them? I had something I wanted to add on to the last comment was um, what she mentioned about the, it might be a Zoom topic or a Zoom pro based project like the excursion or elective, if you want to call it that. Um, but then we took it and my child was motivated to do something about it and, and do something off device the, the, that afternoon, the next day, the next day, and even weeks after. And then my preschooler who I, you know, we were having trouble figuring out what to do with, she joined it. So it became kind of a family affair. And that was really nice because it started with the, with Mrs. Adamson. And so there was that relational connection too, where it started with his teacher, but we took it off device and we took it in home or in nature. 
Fantastic. More your family. Yes. Hi. So as a house with all working parents and kids of a bunch of different ages, I think what really helped was some guidance for what to do when you're not on the Zoom. And that can, for us, all kinds of things were successful, whether it was excursions or assignments where they watched a video and had to write and had to report back on what they did, but some guidance so that as parents, we can say, hey, buddy, you have ownership. Here's your list, whatever that means, wherever you find that you know what you need to do and you can go handle that. And then we have awareness to what they're working on. So we can add communication or conversation or resources to that because we all know what's going on. I think the awareness piece from my end. I want to add to that. Um, we had uh, Ms. Dotson. Uh, my daughter was in kindergarten and we had Ms. Dotson last year. And before they came up with the exploration and all of the, 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 the whole schedule on morning time and then a break and then exploration and the break. Before that, she was sending us uh, a, a, an email or on CISO, she would update on what all tasks the kids had to do that day. So there would be a four or five things. And, uh, and the same thing would be emailed to us or we could see it on our parents' CISO. And that helped a lot because I could just go back with my child and, and uh, talk to my daughter and say that, hey, these are the things that you have to do and let's finish this and upload it on Seesaw. So um, I think that, uh, so this was part uh, uh, away from the, the online, uh, I don't know what's that called, Le Lexia and whatever they were doing. So this was away from that, uh, apart from that. So I think that helped a lot as well. Uh, just that the parents know what all they have to do and uh, that they can go back and upload it on Seesaw to show that they have done it. Fantastic. We have one more minute on this question. I mean, how cool is it? Here we are with 100 people on the Zoom call, and there's 100 on our YouTube live at one time and co-designing. Typically, what happens is say, hey, congratulations, come on September 2nd. This is what school's going to look like. So we're doing this design with you, and that's what's so brilliant about our work. It takes a little bit longer. Remember, like our kids said on that, mistakes are valuable. You know, I was rushing. So don't rush. We want to get this right. Sorry. Oh, Dad. So I go ahead. Hi, this is Sujana here, if I could add in. And um, uh, I just wanted to mention, you know, uh, echo somewhat what Ms. Meyer said, that, you know, keeping in mind the situation with working parents. And we want, of course, parents want to be engaged in the learning of their children. But at the same time, we want to keep in mind that as the learning of the kids, the younger kids is happening, parents have their own responsibilities and their own works to go to. And there can be only limited involvement of the parents and we cannot expect full day involvement of the parents is what I'm trying to say. So keeping in mind that kind of a structure, something where the kids uh, can be independent with some, uh, of course, some guidance from their parents as well. Christina, is it okay if we end with Sai there for this last one? Um, so yeah, I just, I just had two things. One was, um, Providing the kids a go-to place, I think like for them, the device is a go-to place for things that they want to do, but providing them other go-to places like a design journal is something that is really, I know in the past it's worked, like my daughter used to doodle in her notebook that she used to bring sometimes, or my son, uh, I think in third grade, he had a, a journal where they would write ideas and things like that, they would pen down. So just giving them you know, opportunities to kind of reflect in a design journal and making it their own. So then they have ownership of it and through the year they can maintain it, um, gives them time to get off the device. Um, and the second thought right on that same train of thought is there is a lot of new families who probably are new to design thinking as in general, uh, leave alone design 39. Uh, I think uh, it'll be very helpful because I had a learning curve in terms of methodology as well initially. Uh, is just maybe level setting, uh, helping parents kind of understand the design process a little bit up front, just when things are getting started, so they can have more, uh, you know, meaningful conversation with their kids is super helpful, at least from their perspective, like a hundred level or even a, like a 10 level <laughs> course or of some sort, right, for parents to understand thank, that. Thank you, Sai and team. So we're going to move on to the next question. And uh, I know the LEDs are looking at the chat box. We also have our chat on YouTube. So we'll be looking at that data as well. And uh, we want to capture everything in that Padlet. Uh, so we're going to move on to, it looks like uh, Dana and Erica 
And then we'll maybe take a pause. And I know the LEDs are, there's some exciting things they're also thinking about that they might be able to interject uh, after this next question. Erica. So we were looking at, think about this for virtual learning, and some of the themes that we noticed that came up were kind of around form and structure. So different types of small group versus large group, um, pre-recorded versus live, uh, different communication with parents. And so the question that we have for you, um, using the lens of structure and flexibility, is what does quality designed learning look like? Such a good question. Quality designed learning look like? You could feel free to either chat in the chat away or put your hand up. There should be a hand raise hand feature. Hey, Joe. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, how are you? Uh, yep, go ahead. Is that Mark? Yep. Hey, how are you? Hey, Mark. Um, so I think. Um, you know, it really is, it, it's a difficult question to answer, right? Especially as a two working parent household, I think it's really, you know, going back to Cammy's original question about like partnership, I think it is that, you know, we as parents want to be able to support our children and understand that the structure, um, you know, having a, a structure and a schedule to understand what we do. And I know that at D39, we try to be a little more free form and free thinking and, you know, adapt with the learning. And, you know, when we're in class, you know, that's great. And to the extent that we can continue that, but also understand the realities of, you know, like as a two working parent household, neither one of us can sit with our children, you know, every half hour to guide them. Right. And, and the extent that the LEDs can, um, you know, blend the realities of what the just challenges we're facing right now are with you know, blended with what a conventional school day would look like. I think it's just really helpful to keep that in mind because one of the struggles that we're having is, you know, we, what, what we experienced in the spring while great, given what we were able to deal with and, and kudos to everybody who's able to do it, that the prospect of doing that through December or, you know, heaven forbid the entire school year is just not feasible for our family and we don't want our children to be able to fall behind. So the more that we can implement some structure would be really, really helpful um, as much as that sort of goes against the design process. So at least on a daily or weekly basis, we know where we can help set up the kids at the beginning of the day. If there's a midday check-in, that would be great. But the expectation or, you know, the, the thought that, that a parent can be there for every half hour or every segment um, is unfortunately just, just not realistic and will be very challenging moving forward. Uh, I, I have a comment um, similar to a couple of others, what I heard, you know, when we are working full time and constantly back to back meeting that structure definitely helps. But at the same time, having the full day structure is going to be a lot for kids to sit and we are new and we come from a different school. Um, but what my son did last year to us was very helpful. Um, we would get an email and he would also get it on his seesaw, kind of a weekly planner. Um, you know, what they are doing on that week. And when the teacher is doing a Zoom, it's, it's usually like an hour, hour and a half. But that set the tone for the students on what they are doing for the rest of the day. And the teacher kept them accountable to submit that work too. So they were not in front of the screen for the full school day, but they took ownership of their day and they knew what they were doing. That was very helpful. Joe, I'm wondering if we can add um, and just kind of push a little bit too on thinking about the kids and when they were engaged um, in learning, what were some of those highly motivating um, lessons? If we were looking at lesson design and how di different ways we can craft and create these learning experiences, I'm wondering if there is a sense or some continuity in the ones that were really successful for the kids and what those activities are that might lend to extended learning um, off screen at home. Great, Dana. Should I add that as a column? It, it could be, I suppose. Yeah, I'm just thinking if we're looking at lesson design, where like what that might look like with the learning experiences. Dana, could you write that in our Google Doc and then I'll transfer it over? Sure. Yes, we're going to do a quick pause. Uh, 
I think someone wanted to share something real quick. And then we're gonna have the LEDs kind of just take another quick pulse check and then come back in. Amanda, were you gonna say something? Oh no, sorry, my kids are yelling in the background. Uh, Joy, a really quick comment, if I could. You only get two comments a day. I'm kidding. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, kids, I guess different kids learn at, at a different pace to each other. And um, so if there are kids that wrap up their day's work in half an hour and then they're just lying there, that's a recipe for disaster. So I, mean, I don't know how that's best done. How, how is an LED, could you help have kids that are learning at a different rate somehow we continue to be involved at their own pace. Thank you. Great, no, I, thank you, Yash. You know, we, we, we banter back and forth, you and I. So the point here is uh, this is a chance for us LEDs to, if there is anything that you heard or excited about that you've been doing in the background uh, to share at this point, and then we'll jump into the next question. Joe, Carrie had her hand up too. Okay, we'll get Carrie right before we go to the next question. So LEDs, anything to add at this point? Well, I think, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Joe. Oh, I was just going to say, I think what's really important too is um, a, more of a focus on teaching the kiddos how to be advocates for themselves. And also um, to, um, I like that journal idea about, you know, design ideas. Well, how about just ideas? What are you interested in? And if they're done, then they go to their journal and they pick something that they decide what they're going to create or what they're going to research or what they're going to be interested in doing next. Um, I, I really push, you know, it's, you're never done. I mean, you can always go back to your writing, you can add to it. So I think we have to teach the kids, you know, to be agents for themselves. And so I, I think that that's what's most exciting about this virtual experience is, is maybe just shifting, you know, it's not someone up in the front of the room, or even as parents telling them, this is what you need to do, but rather, okay, there are some, you know, standards, there's some things you have to get done. However, this is your opportunity to really push your learning forward. So let's start generating those ideas. What are you interested in pursuing? What do you want to do? And there are a lot that maybe don't even know. So and maybe as a class, we can generate those ideas and then they can pick from those too. I think we're also trying to look at the tension of the ebb and flow where we have a period of time you know, a half hour, say, where we're on Zoom, and then time for them to work afterwards, and then a little bit more time on Zoom. So that kind of ebb and flow between keeping them engaged with us and then having some time to work on their own so they're not, their eyes aren't always on the screen. So we're trying to design that in a pocket of time that is even maybe consistent for TK3 so that kids are, you know, all on an excursion, whether they're in TK or third at the same time and then working. So it gives you some consistency across the board TK3 as well. All right, it sounds like we're ready for the next question and that will go into, um, I think Jamie. Jamie, your question around staying connected. For creating connections and building relationships, we noticed a range of different ideas for ways that students can connect with one another and for how students might connect with LEDs. And so we're wondering, how have you stayed connected with family, friends, and neighbors during, during COVID? Such a great, great question, because you think about, we have done these things naturally uh, at home. And we wanting to know the critical component of staying connected, staying um, um, viable with the work that we do. How have you done that in your own ecosystem? Raise your hand or share your, your thoughts. Matthew, thank you. So we've used the electronic tools and then kind of have a new family at the park from walking around it every day, it seems like. But I think the main thing is that it has to be intentional. If you don't plan it, structure it, it just doesn't happen because there's really no serendipity if everyone's sitting home. You have to build opportunities for that into your day, either through texting or reminders or something to, hey, reach out to one friend every day or 
you know, call this person. I, and it sounds weird, but you have to structure it or the day flies by and you can't even remember what day it is. Great feed forward, uh, Matthew. Uh, Flemings, are you a new family with us this year? Yes, we are invading with three boys, first or second, sixth, and eighth. So looking forward to an awesome experience. Um, heard nothing but great things and, and, you know, meetings like this are why we made the switch. So looking forward to meeting everyone in person. Uh, yeah, this is, I can tell you, it's super unique. I, I, there's people that are making schedules first and then telling you what it's going to be. This, this is not <laughs> happening, like across the nation, really. And we have a whole session that's happening with students, and uh, it's fantastic. It's going to be fun to showcase that. They're actually going to be on a national convention on Monday showcasing how we design with students at the table, right? So we always ask who's at the table and who's not. And oftentimes the school has been created um, and done to you, so you get schooled. So what we want is learning at the center. We're a learner-centered lab school. Awesome. Uh, other ideas? Hands up. I see uh, Arzan. Hi, actually, this is his wife, um, Del Lali. We have a new son, uh, a son that's coming in new as a new student um, this year. And to answer your um, question about how we stay connected, I can tell you from um, a more professional or work environment, like um, at my job, when we, the way we stay connected, um, especially when we're launching like new processes and we know there's going to be many users needing guidance, we have like one team member that's on call um, through a virtual Zoom that's day long where people can go in, get connected, ask questions, ask for tips or resources of any kind regarding a topic or whatever. So in, the, in, in a student's case, is that something that's available where let's say an LED can be on call for the third grade for that particular weekday and they would be, uh, our student would be able to log in quickly and get access to that one-on-one -on -one kind of care. LED, please respond. Cammy, do you want to respond or do you want me to? I can I can take that on, I suppose. Um, you know, we're still working out our structures, and I think a lot of the empathy that we are gathering here is going to help us. Um, I can speak on behalf of um, what we were doing in the spring, and we definitely are interested in making ourselves available um, every day for the kids. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some of the structures that we were using last uh, spring had to do with one-on-one -on -one conferencing to having office hours where kids were encouraged to come to those office hours to drop in um, mm -hmm. when questions came up or they just needed to connect at the beginning of the day to just get themselves started if we weren't having mm -hmm. a Zoom meeting right away. Okay, thank you. So, and, and to Yash's, I think his name is Yash, to his previous comment about that it's very important to have the one-on-one -on -one sort of connection with the teachers in the beginning, perhaps, of the school year, especially for those new students, I think it's going to be invaluable. And, and us being new to the school, that's, one, that's been one of our biggest concerns, connection with the teacher and, of course, um, his uh, age group. Sure. Well, I can tell you it's been dominating quite a bit of our thoughts, too, as to how we build and are, are wanting to connect with the kids, because we definitely feel um, how valuable that is throughout the year as well, and what we've been missing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, Pra did I say that correctly, Prachi? Please correct yeah, me. Prachi. Hi, so I have Thank two you, daughters. Uh, uh, do you hear me right? Uh, I have two daughters. Uh, one is going to the second grade, and then one is starting kinder. Uh, we had great experience uh, last year with Ms. Power and Emily's uh, group. Um, we had this one-on-one -on -one connection with the teachers and uh, they also set up like small groups to check in and that was a level-based group. So if there is a math group or something, uh, she would do a small, uh, a small like four students or five students and do a small breakout session where she goes in with that student, uh, comes back in and uh, do the stuff. Uh, touching to the uh, how I connect, how we connecting to the other um, other friends and all that stuff. So we uh, find this really helpful. Uh, we do like a couple of times in a week and they just uh, do their FaceTime with the friends and they just do talking, do the drawing. We bought the similar books for the girls. 
so they can just color the same stuff share the thoughts and the talking goes on they did some writing too that was really nice and read to each other um, that piece was nice to connect with the friends um, and they they know like every day if i write she, i will be reading to her and uh, it was giving them that motivation that helped Fantastic. I know we had two more hands raised. I want, we have two more questions that we want to get to. And so hopefully uh, we can get to you as well. Uh, so we're going to move on with uh, our next question with Michelle and Julie. So as we see, connections are huge. And I think, you know, the kids have verbalized it to all of us is that, you know, they just want time with their friends. And that's really important, not only for their well-being, but for also the um, the opportunities for learning that um, the critical thinking, the positive collaboration between peers. So I think what we're most curious about is how might you envision these virtual experiences to really support with strategies, those social emotional well-being of kiddos? Like we, you know, try to embed it in our lessons um, in the morning meetings, try to have rituals uh, that they can always, you know, kind of cling to, um, giving them ways to respond well. Um, do puppets, you know, interactions, role playing, what works, what doesn't work or in your experience so far to help um, with those strategies? Because this is definitely at the top of our list for our kids. Yeah, SEL is social emotional learning. Oh, SEL. sorry. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So we have a hands up. Uh, please correct me. Uh, Shajwani, can you? Press That's okay. That's my last name. I'm Gunjin. Yeah. I oh, have two, here yeah. you are. <laughs> um, I How have do you two... say it though? Because it's it's appropriate for equity. No, that's okay. Thank you. Um, so my oldest one was with Sacramento last year and the youngest one was with Jacqueline Vasco. And the one thing that really helped us with that connection was piggyback to what we were talking about was the office hours that they had. And my daughter always made sure she scheduled a spot every week for the office hours and the office hours was not always about educational stuff. Mm -hmm. It was, what did you do? What have you been doing? What did you like? And the LED paid very close attention to what she was talking about. And she would actually help her connect with someone else in the classroom who was doing something similar. So if she was reading a specific book or playing with certain toy, the LED would mention the child's name that, hey, they were also doing that or they talked about it. And after the Zoom call, she would be like, this person in my classroom is doing that. Can we connect with them? And I want to talk to them about that. So that really helped. It was not all focused on just math and English or language. It was talking about random things and just having that connection really did help her. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Rachel. Hi, I'm the one with the three kids making faces at you. Um, so I have three coming in this year, um, all in the TK through three span. Um, two of them were um, part of the distant learning that we did um, starting in March. Um, I agree with Gunjin as far as my child really did look forward to the office hours and the one-on-one -on -one time with their LED, where they didn't always talk about the math or the current assignment or the current design challenge. They talked about um, regular things as far as what did you do today? What do you miss? Who do you miss? What do you wish you can do outside? And um, that connection to that teacher specifically for them, I know my kids, they loved it. Um, one of my other children, he was in kinder last year. He had Miss Jeanette. And the other thing that he loved is they went into breakout rooms with other um, classmates where they can talk about what they did over the weekend or um, what they made in house or their design challenge that they already did. Um, and so that conversation piece, I think is a piece that's missing in Zoom calls because um, you all have to wait your turn and only one person speaks at a time. And that doesn't really invite normal conversation, which is how most children at this age adapt and pick up on the SEL um, because then they're put in situations where they do have to learn how to wait their turn and they do have to learn that this person doesn't have the same idea as them. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that for the TK learning aspect, but I did wanna say that the game piece and the game board really gave my sons um, a real, I guess, 
responsibility for their own learning and their own adv advocacy because they knew exactly where to go in the morning. So those are all my pieces. Thank you. I think we have time for one more in this space. Uh, Moyer family. So one of my fourth graders last year, his teacher did something really cool because he's not naturally social. So he's not going out on like Facebook, on his little messenger or games, talking to anyone. He was kind of in a hole. She would end their daily Zoom and leave it open for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes and give them a game to get started, like rock, paper, scissor and set them up in little groups. And then I, th I think she would bow out. I kind of mostly heard it, but they would get in interactions and they would have to figure out arguing over, no, you did a rock, you did a paper. So they had that like emotional fun connection, but they also had to work on the troubleshooting and collaborating and fixing stuff when you're disagreeing over who had a rock or a paper and it was little stuff, but they loved it. And I could always tell when they switched into that mode because his voice would change, everything would change and he would stay on until the very last second. Um, so I think it was a cool way that she found for them to get some social and emotional connection and some troubleshooting and that kind of stuff in a fun format. Fantastic. So I saw uh, Michelle Jeanette, our TK teacher, yes. was just talking about utilizing parent volunteers in breakout rooms. And that's a specific that we'll be working on with our collaborative uh, level two volunteering. And what does that look like so that um, we have those safe protocols, but in partnership with our uh, LEDs. We're going to end out our questions here because we have the next Zoom call. We have two more of these going for our four or five and then our six, eight. And I want to make sure I get in that room enough time. Uh, so we're going to end with this with, um, I think, Michelle and Sammy. Or, sorry, Taylor and Sammy. Um, so our final question, it was just final thoughts or what else are you wondering? Um, and we wanted to ask um, access to materials. What are some items that might be needed? Uh, Sammy, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just want to add that we, um, you know, obviously we work on the tech piece. So we're going to make sure that you're all set up with the technology. Um, and our your homeroom LED will be reaching out to set up um, and get in touch with you and see what specific materials you need and supplies. But we're also just wondering what else you need from us. Not necessarily um, tangible, but also tangible. So what are some things that you need from us um, moving forward? Aren't these guys amazing? Like literally, like they can read your mind, right? So talking about those materials, I know there's some probably some chatter in our parent network group. So here it is, they're asking the question, they wanna know more, what are those things that you need? Maybe some design kits that we can have the collaborative and the parents help like pass those out through some of these cool drive-by sessions. So Sammy Taylor, thank you for that. I see, I just see MC, MC. Aria. Hi, Joe. Sorry. Um, I wanted to know, um, are we going to have extra sessions for the students who have IEPs? Tell me more. Um, I just want to know, because our son, he has um, an IEP of stuttering. And normally in um, the campus, we have a weekly meeting with our IEP teacher. And we just want to know if that will continue on in the fall. Yeah, we'll have specific uh, meetings just to call out our students with special needs and supporting that. And district is still giving us some guidance and uh, David Dickerman and Liz, and we have a, a growing team in that space along with our counselors. So yeah, look for more information coming specifically for our students with special needs. So we'll have another session. Uh, Amy Richardson already hosted uh, two or three sessions just to kind of do a front load on that. We're also doing sessions with our English language learners. So lots of different ways to kind of capturing this. So please stay tuned and um, put that maybe in the chat box at the far end that Sammy was mentioning, things you need still. Um, hello, um, I'm sorry, my oh, name sure. is Vivian Ordinario and I, my son also has an IEP for speech and OT. And um, actually I never received any emails from Amy Richardson about any um, meetings, but I think I'm the one who emailed you earlier this morning. I didn't get the Zoom link for this meeting either, but I did get all the ones for four and five. So maybe yeah, that's- I think, yeah, I think Mary reached back out to you, right? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're still, remember, we're still going through all the registration data. And so there's some new things that we have to get your signature page, which also has your new updated data. So if you could be kind and, and patient with us. Um, I get one or two emails a day. So we want to make sure- oh, that yes. I just wanted to make sure I'm up to date with all the information, especially for the ones on the IEP. On the um, meeting that we had with Poway Unified, at the very end of that um, hour-long meeting with, the, with all of those people, um, they had mentioned a special meeting for those with IEPs that is happening on August 18th. It had three letters like CAC or... 
Skia, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe a skia. It's usually one on ones. Yeah. Um, but it was it was some it was a big event that they were having for Power Unified dealing with IEP. So I wasn't sure if that information was going to come out as well. Yeah, I see Jill. Jill may be in the know as well. Jill, you want to talk about that real quick? Cooley? Yes, I see it. No. Okay, hey, there we go. Now I'm unmuted. It's the community advisory committee. So that the the parent and uh, liaison group to the, the special ed district uh, directors. So it um, if Joe wants to put me in touch with you, I'm happy to send you the link for that. It, it's a meeting for parents of children with IEPs and special ed. As you know, Jill was on our safety team and also advocate and has uh, children at Design 39. Thank I do. You. Can uh, I answer a question? that question that we were started on real quick? Can yeah, I and comment then, uh, about Amanda, that? you're in the queue. Amanda Carlson, you're Oh, in no, queue. if there's someone else there, that's totally no, fine. Go ahead, Jill. I just want to, I wanted to say, I, I had this thought about, um, you know, as we're starting off the year that a lot of kids don't even know what virtual learning or distance learning or anything means. Like, you know, in general, they just know they go to school and they learn, right? So I, I kind of think that, and since families might have different perspectives about wanting to be back on campus versus not, I think also helping them to understand that Design 39 is still their school, you know, when the teacher kind of, when they start off the year, I'm still your teacher, this is what's constant. I think that could be really helpful too. And um, not forgetting the piece about just kind of going back to the basics of we're learning at home, but Design 39 is still your school. Um, so for example, in our house, we're gonna put up a big sign that says Design 39 at home. So that there's that, there's that continuity um, and your teacher's still your teacher. We're gonna put up all your pictures. So be forewarned. Awesome, <laughs> love it, right? Uh, learning happens everywhere, right? Um, school is just a construct of where we meet. Uh, Amanda, you're going to bring us home. I need to get into the next meetings. There's lots of data here on this pad. Well, we have lots of work to do. As you can see, we're super excited about that. Amanda, bring us home. Really quick, you, and things we need. The district had mentioned that every school is going to use the same learning platform. or And I was curious, is that true for Design 39? Or like versus Alt School versus, you know, uh, Seesaw, XYZ? Is, is, it's design 39. It's like saying every student is exactly the same. So every student's going to get the exact same platform. Right. So we're going to have some continuity so that you have some continuity between K3, you'll have continuity between four, five, and you'll have continuity between six, eight. Um, and Perfect. we're trying to, yeah. to leverage the best platforms and best supports for the need. That's to say one size platform will do everything we need. Um, there might be a place that you can jump into that you can get all of your content because that's a trick. We understand that's a challenge. Um, but just very transparently, I, uh, I put my trust behind the LEDs and empathizing with the parents to say what is the need. Um, all right, I'll probably get my hand slapped again. So there you go. Um, here we have it. So what I want to end with is just first, just appreciate you. For you. As you know, we do multiple design jams. You're going to have a chance to meet with the teachers. You're going to be a chance to connect with the kids because now you're going to have the roster. You're going to have the roster of the kids who are in your class and you can start to make those little micro groups. That doesn't happen yet. You're gonna get that two days before school, maybe at your, your child's campus. Um, and then also just next week, we're gonna introduce the new counselors. So we have two fabulous new counselors. We'll also do some work around 39 days of giving. I think that's gonna be really- I don't think Tasha, because Tasha's back in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and I think the piece that I want to share there, like for instance, our teachers get paid three days before school starts. Uh, two days ago, the collaborative said, you know, we need to do something that makes that right. So they gave each teacher six hours of planning time. We know it's not enough, but that's the collaborative. That comes because of 39 days of giving and your generosity. We're going to have a whole session with the loft. We're opening up the loft next week. And uh, there's all kinds of books, over probably $10,000 a year that's spent just on loft and loft books and digital books, from the light box to overdrive. So look for another session that's going to happen just to understand how do you access all these rich materials. That comes from the collaborative and your donations. So look for a meeting next Thursday. That one's gonna be with the, the counselors so we can kind of dig in a little bit further with the social emotional. The following week, I would imagine our LEDs would probably wanna network with you either by classroom or by cluster or by floor or by pod. So uh, giving them some space to do that work and dig into this. I hope you enjoyed this session. Uh, I hope you appreciate what we're doing. We value you very much clearly because um, the future is the place we create. Thank you for joining up on our live stream and we're going to end here. All right. We'll see you guys soon.